I'm your host, Michael Shermer. For this episode, I'd like to uh, do a special thank you to our new sponsor, Ground News, which is an app you get on your phone that looks like this. You just touch the app and it opens right up and you get uh, breaking news stories and updates on news stories and so on, but not from the left or the right or any particular uh, media bias, but from all different perspectives with a uh, bias grading for each particular story. Now, let me tell you why I love this app, because here is yesterday's newspapers that I have to go through uh, to try to get a balanced view. I have the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and for good measure, my local paper, the Santa Barbara News Press. Uh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, I consume a lot of paper, and I spend a lot of time grinding through articles to try to figure out what's really going on. So Ground News actually takes a different approach in improving the broken media ecosystem. They are a news comparison platform, giving you the ability to compare how sources with different biases are covering a story, so you can easily see if it's being spun to fit a political narrative. The app, which you get on your phone... Uh, also alerts you to any news blind spots that you may have, stories that are only covered by one side of the political spectrum. So, as a listener of this show, uh, I'd like you to go to ground news, ground.news slash Shermer and download your free app. That is, go to ground.news slash Shermer and you can download the app for free. And it just takes just like two minutes to sign up and open an account and you're rocking and rolling here. You could just scroll through and see what are some of the breaking stories. Here's like the coverage bias of this particular story on Trump's tax returns. You can see there's a lot more blue than red in there. And on the other hand, there's a lot more red than blue in this next story about coronavirus and so forth. And uh, so anyway, thank you for supporting the show. Uh, ground News, and again, ground.news slash Shermer, and that gets you to your free app. Thanks for listening. Before I introduce today's guest, our sponsor of the podcast is The Great Courses. It's an app you can get, Great Courses Plus. You just touch it on your phone like that. It opens right up. Here's the course I'm going to start this week called How to Speak Effectively in Any Setting. Well, I do this for a living, so you'd think I would know all that, but I don't. There's tons of things here. There's a total of 24 lectures. Uh, they're about 25 minutes each. I listen to them at 1.2 speed, so it brings it down to about 20 minutes per lecture. So you can uh, listen to these anytime you're driving, hiking, cycling, walking, doing chores, etc. You can skip around. There's, I'm not going to listen to all 24 of these lectures. I'll probably just do maybe half a dozen, then I'll skip to some other course. So here's the deal. Uh, if you sign on through their webpage, through um, my podcast, you get $30 off the annual fee. It comes out to about 10 bucks a month, and you get a free trial. So I want you to go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer, and you get 30 bucks off, and a free trial comes out to about 10 bucks a month for uh, the year. So that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer. Now, my guest today is Abigail Schreier. Her book is called Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. Okay, this is a very worrisome social contagion movement. And so we get into uh, what the baseline rate is of gender dysphoria, or trans, uh, at, at about 0.01%. And there's this huge spike after 2007 to, say, maybe uh, last week. I mean, it just been, keeps going up. And uh, the cause of potential causes of this uh, in uh, social media and in schools and in, in the culture at large. We talk about all the technical terms, what does it mean to be LGBTQ and so forth, um, and you transition from male to female or female to male, uh, some of the different uh, issues involved uh, in terms of different age groups that do this. It's mostly teenagers that are going through this, and how we determine causality, how do you know it's uh, social media and not some something else. How do you know they weren't always there, and this just makes it available for them to come out? And uh, and then some of the pushback she's gotten. I read some of the criticisms of her book, and she responds to those. 
We talk about universal human rights, how it doesn't really matter how many people have this disorder, or even if it is a disorder, maybe it's not. It's just the way things are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's just one person. Everybody is protected under the Constitution. Everybody should have universal human rights. And uh, so we set that off the table and just talk about the facts. And uh, it's a fascinating conversation. We cover a lot of ground, very controversial ground. Hopefully we won't be canceled for this. Should be okay to talk about, which is another point we discuss uh, quite a bit. So with that, I give you Abigail Schreier. Abigail Schreier. Okay, great. Nice to see you. Yes. How are you? I don't think we've ever great met. Great to see you. I don't think we've ever met in person. Uh, no, we I, haven't. I've seen a number of your shows on uh, Dave Rubin and, and Joe Rogan and, and a few of the others. And I read your book in audio. I, I didn't get a physical copy, so I can't hold it up. Uh, but we'll plug it, we'll plug it on <laughs> online um, when we post okay. this. But uh, so I, I had to kind of take careful notes through uh, some of the reviews uh, and, and your shows and stuff. And I have most of it from memory because I just finished it uh, two days ago. It's a disturbing book. I mean, to the extent that uh, these things are are happening at an accelerating rate, that is this, this uh, transitioning from female to male amongst adolescents. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so something's obviously up here. What exactly is it? So that's, and, and I thought we should start with, uh, I read some, I, I read the negative reviews and, and it's the typical thing you see where I think people are confusing facts and values. That is to say, whatever the actual rate is of a gender dysphoria or trans or whatever we want to call it, 0.01%, 1%, 10%, what, whatever the number is, it is whatever it is, regardless of whether you're conservative or liberal or progressive or woke or not woke or me or you, it doesn't matter. Um, and, it, if, and if we commit to universal human rights, it doesn't matter if it's just one person. Uh, you know, if they're, a, if they're a citizen of the United States, they should be protected by the Constitution. They should have all the civil liberties that everybody else has. I think maybe we should start by acknowledging that that we really want to focus on the facts of the case, not the moral uh, judgment. Because I see people call you transphobe uh, because your facts differ from their facts. That's that that's that's a, a you know a misdirection. That's that's not correct. <laughs> if the facts are whatever they are, uh, and, and so let's let's start by kind of acknowledging that commitment to universal human that, rights. That- of course. I mean, it is misdirection. It's misdirection because not only do I support full full civil rights, of course, for all transgender people, but more importantly, I don't even oppose at all medical transition for mature adults. In fact, during the course of my investigation, I became convinced that, you know, through my interviews, that it was beneficial to some people and had no doubt helped them quiet um, their gender dysphoria and um, and that they were leading good, productive, healthy lives um, of, you know, I, I have no interest in interfering with those lives or hampering them or, or casting any sort of negative, you know, negative or pejorative connotation on them. Um, it, quite, quite honestly, the transgender adults I interviewed in the course of writing the book were some of the soberest and loveliest people I have come to know. Um, I'm just talking about teenage girls and it's a medical question. Why are so many of them transitioning? And um, we we have to ask that. We have to ask that because when you see a demographic that has never before experienced a condition in any numbers of significance, and all of a sudden in the last 10 years, they become the leading demographic across the West and they're getting hormones and surgeries on demand based on self-diagnosis. It's worth asking is this a correct diagnosis? Should they be getting, should they have absolutely no oversight, which they basically do. They have no effective oversight because it's all based on self-diagnosis. And, and are they being helped by this? I mean, if you don't ask those questions, I, I, you know, you're, you're just not really, you know, an engaged person. And so that, that's how I see the, the issue. Yeah. I think to make an analogy in the nineties, uh, there was kind of a push in the gay community to find biological markers for homosexuality to say it's not a lifestyle choice. It's the way we were born. I was born this way. This, I think it was Lady Gaga who said. Um, and I remember when I was putting on my lecture series at Caltech, I brought in, I think it was Michael Bailey, who had just published a study on the hippocampal differences between straight straights and gays. And he put up this slide and he goes, you, you, you know, you know, at the cellular level, neural level. And he says, 
You know, you can clearly see here the difference between gay and straight hippocampal neural cells or whatever it was. And it's like everybody was looking like, where? Uh, uh, it's really hard to see that. And I don't think that research ended up panning out, but we were all rooting for it to, to pan out because we all wanted to support the idea that if it's not a lifestyle choice, you're born that way, therefore we should be more accepting and maybe conservatives will then drop the whole, you know, pray away the gay business and, and, and so on. But again, it, it doesn't matter whether it's purely biological or purely cultural or some balance in between, obviously, it, 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 what it is. They should still enjoy the same rights as everybody else. That's that confusion. And now, after reading your book, it almost seems like a reversal. Like, you know, gays have been fighting for this idea that it's biology, not culture. This is who we are. You can't discriminate uh, against somebody based on who they are. And now this new movement seems to be you can be anything you want. It's purely choice and culture. Yeah, I mean, there's a paradox because they say, on the one hand, it's immutable so no one should ever um, hamper my ability to get access on drug to the hormones, no matter my age, the context, how fast this came on, whether there's no mental health, you know, you know, over mental health oversight or any other medical oversight to see, make sure the diagnosis is correct. But also I might be gender fluid and I reserve the right to change my mind. Yeah. So that's a problem. It's a problem because because of the age of these girls and the sudden with suddenness with which this, you know, supposed diagnosis comes on and the fact that no one's checking to make sure it's accurate. I mean, remember, it's worth asking whether this is an accurate diagnosis, even for one patient. Mm -hmm. it, what if there's just one patient out there, you know? I mean, shouldn't doctors want to know that? Instead, what you get is a lot of opposition specifically from the young activist crop of doctors. Yeah. So um, just factually, what are the numbers? I think you quoted the baseline rate of 0.01%, something like that. How much has it gone up in the last 10 years? I see numbers bouncing all over the place. What do we really know? Numbers do bounce all over the place. So it's 0.01% for the general population. But remember, that was overwhelmingly male. And I think for females, I think it's 0.003%, which is even smaller. I mean, these are numbers that round to zero. They are tiny, which means that you, you, when you and I were in a high school, we probably knew no one who ended up being transgender. Mm -hmm. But now we know that according to the CDC, 2% of high school students are, are you know, uh, as of 2018, have said they were transgender. That's a lot of kids. That's hundreds of thousands of kids. And we have every indication that the number is going up, not down, because not only are the number of clinics exploding in America, there's obviously tremendous demand. They're well over 60 after we, you know, a decade ago we had two. Now, now it looks like there's around 65. Um, and um, you know, Planned Parenthood gives it out across the country, testosterone out across the country. This is a burgeoning industry. But also, um, when you look at other countries in the West that have the same social media influence, a lot of the same media, um, they their numbers, I mean, in the gender clinic, they have a nationalized clinic, so you can see the numbers more easily. And in, in Britain, the number of referrals to their gender identity clinic for, for natal males, biological, sorry, natal females, biological females, rose over 4,000%. Mm. So that's, you know, we, it's harder for us to know the numbers in the U.S. because we don't have centralized um, medical care. But wh where they do, we're seeing very, very high numbers. And this is true, you know, if you look across, you know, uh, the West, Sweden, Norway. I mean, these are ve they're very high numbers coming out of those places. Surprised the uh, chemtrail and fluoridation conspiracy theorists having gone in on this. It's in the water. It's in the air. <laughs> they do. They do. I mean, they oh. do. I get. Oh my God, you know, really? I get all all kinds of messages. Uh, I'll bet you. Yeah, do. because because you know, yeah. Some people write to me and they say, "Have you considered vaccines? Maybe vaccines are causing this." And um, you you know, whenever you see a population with with a condition and that population suddenly spikes, and it's a new population in this case, it's not you know little kids starting in childhood, but adolescents, teenage girls with no childhood history. We've never seen this before. It's yeah. always worth worth asking why. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and then uh, let's also make a distinction between uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the labels are. I get confused, even though I've been reading a lot of this stuff. So there's there's tra male to female trans and then female to male trans. Is that the correct 
uh, description? Well, or, you or, know, the, these and, terms, um, yeah. And once you make the transition, then Sorry. you're just trans. You're not. Uh, but if you say, well, I'm a trans man, does that mean you were a woman and now you're a man? That's right. Okay. I, I think the terms are, are, are um, there might be some intention behind how confusing the terms are because they are changing. They are always changing. Um, there are some terms that almost no one even knows what they mean. Mm. Um, you know, you can be gender queer. You know, all these different categories. And I, I think the purpose of some of them is is to confuse so that it's harder to have a conversation, an honest and open one. And which, of course, does not mean we would ever, you know, um, that the conversation would need to be pejorative or threaten anybody's rights or, God forbid, you know, their welfare. But um, but but I think that, you know, you see this among many movements in the hard left, a desire to make it so that we can't have a conversation at all. Yeah. Um, so so sometimes I very often I refer to biological females or biological males when when I feel like I need to, because nobody knows what a trans boy is um, or a trans girl. They get they get confused. Yeah. Yeah. When Ellen Page came out as Elliot Page and said she was she said she was trans masculine. And I'm not sure what that means compared to just trans or female to male trans or whatever. And then you see like, like yeah, her, I mean, you're seeing you're, her, her Wikipedia page. I mean, it just reads so weirdly, you know, he won best actress for whatever the movie was. Maybe it was Juno. Uh, and it's like, OK, what does that actually mean? I'll tell you a funny story. I was about halfway through your book and I, I went uh, to have lunch with an old friend and I'm telling him about your, your book. And he goes, oh, I know a, I know a middle-aged man who transitioned to becoming a woman. And, uh, and, and, but he was married with three kids, and the wife said, well, okay, as long as you don't break up the family and, you know, do whatever you want, uh, you know, and I still want to have sex with you. And he's like, okay. And so he started taking the hormones, and according to my friend, uh, the wife was kind of relieved, actually, because he got smaller down there, and it was a, he was a little big, and it was uncomfortable for her, so the sex was actually better. Okay. But then at some point he says, you know, I, I identify as a woman now and I'd like to have sex with a woman, a lesbian woman. And the wife is like, OK, but you still have a penis. So if you're having lesbian sex with a woman, but you're putting your penis in her vagina, isn't that straight sex? What does it mean to be lesbian if you're just having straight sex? And I remember just thinking my wife would never go for this. <laughs> Sorry for the joke. <laughs> uh, I understand it's complicated, but to, to you know, to to me, you know, it's like okay, let's can we agree on some terms and what these things mean? But it, maybe it's still fluid because it's so new. Well, you know what what your friend described is actually not new. So you know, when you have you know that that we have a hundred year diagnostic history of, and we used to call them what, transsexuals. Um, but they were, you know, usually started in early childhood, ages two to four, little boys who were, for various reasons, you know, really uncomfortable. And it's a terrible discomfort in their biological sex. Um, and these these were young men who often sort of cross-dressed in secret for years. You know, mm. they're people like, um, you know, you mentioned J. Michael Bailey, who, who've, who've documented this, you know, really in, in, in really wonderful writing. Um, and... And, you know, it was something that that sort of always existed. What we never saw before was the social component this this where where young girls, not only is it is it overwhelmingly girls now, but that they're they're transitioning in friend groups. They're gaining popularity. They're watching these YouTube trans influencers. They're becoming convinced and they are adamant that they want these surgeries right now. They can't wait another moment. Um, there's a hysteria around it that that really looks more like other social contagions than it does traditional gender dysphoria. Yeah. Um, and then let's also make a distinction between who you identify as and who you're attracted to, because that also gets confusing. Th that's right. The book has nothing to do with sexual orientation at all. Um, uh, you know, you can be attracted to it to anyone and, and, and still be trans or, you know, they would say, you know, some people would say cis or whatever, meaning not trans, right. um, gender. So, um, yeah, the, the book has nothing to do with gender, um, with, with sexual orientation, except that, um, I did, I did interview a lot of, you know, LGBTQ members broadly, but also a lot of lesbians who are 
particularly concerned about this issue because they um, many believe that a lot of these young girls, if left alone, would emerge as gay adults, um, gay mm -hmm. women. And instead, they are um, being convinced or convincing themselves that they're feeling, Im you know, imperfectly feminine means that they're boys and they're going through these surgeries and and hormonal treatments that, will you know, that th th they don't need or and don't seem to be doing them very much good. Yeah, somebody wrote that article. What happened to, to lesbians? I forget who that was. But it was making an argument like that. And then Andrew Sullivan, who I'm a longtime fan of, uh, you know, he's a gay guy, gay conservative, sort of Catholic, libertarian, maybe. In any case, he, he has an interesting perspective on these things. And when this started happening, I don't know, about a year ago, he wrote an essay saying, you know, when I was a, a young, uh, when I was a teenager, I was attracted to other boys. And I realized, well, I'm, I'm gay. Now, if you have those feelings, maybe you're 14, 15, and you're attracted to other boys, there's this pressure to, well, maybe you're secretly a girl. And for Andrew, who's been an activist for gay rights for 30, 40 years, he's going, no, no, dude, you're a, you're a gay guy, and it's okay now. We've fought for all these rights. You don't have to do this other thing. That's right. I mean, there's a huge difference between saying, I'm, I'm gay, that's who I'm attracted to, which is a, you know, um, a completely harmless <laughs> Um, statement and I'm supposed to be the opposite sex. Now let me immediately make all these major physical um, interventions, especially when I'm the one self-diagnosing. So, you, you know, a lot of these teenagers, they don't even have mental health professionals sign signing off. Um, they don't have doctors signing off that they have the diagnostics correct. And with this population of teenage girls, very often they, they, they're struggling with a lot of other mental health problems. So they, they're in genuine pain. They have a lot of it and they're quickly transitioning to becoming boys, which, in, in, or, or have the appearance of boys anyway, um, in, in, with procedures that are, can be very dangerous and, and frankly, unnecessary. Yeah. That part of your book was really upsetting. I mean, just disturbing. And then I went online, maybe this was not a good idea, but maybe all kids should, should, should go through this. You know, I Googled under image, uh, you know, top, Top surgery, comma, botched. Oh, my God. I, you, this is an image you don't want to have in your brain. And then the bottom surgery, the phallo, um, what is it? Phallo plasty. Plasty. Phallo plasty. Also botched. And oh, my God. It's terrible. And uh, I mean, so again, it's one thing to go through a teenage phase where you dye your hair blue or, you know, you, you pierce something or you get a tattoo. You know, these are largely reversible, especially the hair color. But the, the things you're talking about, these these girls doing, what's going to happen in 10, 15 years where they go, whoa, who let who let me do that? That was insane. Well, we're already seeing because the population of detransitioners, young women who regret who tried to transition back, they regret their medical uh, transition. Um, not only is that population growing fast, but we had this, you know, courageous young woman named Kira Bell in England who just won her suit against the gender clinic there. And she said, I had mm. a lot of problems. I had a lot, I was going through a really rough adolescence. Um, and I was quickly fast tracked to transition. I became convinced I should be a boy and I regret it. And today she's living as a lesbian, but she has, you know, all these physical changes she underwent, the top surgery, the testosterone, which permanently alters you in all kinds of ways and puts fertility at very serious risk. Um, you know, th this is what's happening to a whole generation of, of of young women who probably aren't really gender dysphoric at all. Yeah, I thought about that. That's uh, I'm glad to hear that because that's what's going to put an end to to the social contagion. That's your thesis, and I think it's correct. Uh, in the same way that we saw the the recovered memory movement in the 1990s, which just you know just took off. For those not familiar with this, this was uh, adult, largely women, going to therapists. For various reasons, weight gain, weight loss, sleep disorders, depression, anxiety, and so forth. And then these therapists who had kind of channeled their inner Freud and had this idea that, you know, we repress certain memories, but they're buried in there, particularly trauma, particularly sexual trauma. You know, maybe you've been sexually assaulted. And these women would go, no, I, I wasn't. Well, I know you say you weren't because you don't remember it. It's a repressed memory. Now, Let's spend the next couple of weeks talking about it and tell me about your dreams and, and let's look for key words that are indicators that you were sexually assaulted. 
molested and and so forth. And and, and lo and behold, a couple of months later, they go, "Yep, you were right. I, I I now I remember." And now it's important to, to 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 make a note that you know sexual molestation is real and does go on. So this is where it gets a little tricky. What's the evidence? You know, when every all of your siblings go, "No, that never happened," and of course the parents are in denial. And and in the social contagion of the movement, denial is proof of guilt, right? So the dad says, I never did that, or the uncle or the grandfather. And it's like, ah, now we know he did because he denies it like a witch hunt. And uh, it, But what ended it finally was these women then suing these therapists because it ruined their lives and broke up families. And some of these guys ended up in prison for uh, as child molesters. They were convicted based on solely on these recovered memories with no uh, uh, corroborating evidence. To the country. So that brought it to an end. Same thing with the satanic panic in the 1980s, where the FBI finally said, okay, we're going to go to all these towns and we're going to uncover these cults. There were none. And that finally put an end to it. That's right. And what you said is really important, that just because something has become a social contagion doesn't mean it's not real. I would never say that gender dysphoria isn't real. Of course it is. Anorexia is also real. I mean, a lot of these things are real. The, and bulimia is real as well. But when, and, and there's a great book on this, uh, Ethan Waters, I think it's called Crazy Like Us, talks about how when Princess Di came out and as bulimic, having struggled with bulimia, all of a sudden, all across the West, you right. saw all these women become bulimic. Why? Because they were in pain. The pain was real. But they got the idea of channeling it that way, of locating it in in that set of behaviors from, you know, the from hearing uh, the story of Princess Diana. And, and you have the same thing here. There, there is real gender dysphoria. There are little boys who grow up with this or even girls who have had it. But what it doesn't look like is whole groups of friends in seventh grade deciding they're trans. That's not what it looks like. It doesn't look like spending hours and hours mesmerized by, you know, trans influencers online and then deciding that's the key to all your problems. That's, yeah. that's really not what gender dysphoria has ever looked like. Right. Yeah, that reminded me of the work of uh, Nicholas Christakis on you know social networking, and uh, he published those famous papers on smokers that hang around with other smokers and obese people ended up having a lot of obese friends and so on. You pick up these these habits and cues from other people, and it, it really drives a lot of these also social contagions like this. Um, now, do we have enough of a database to say how many people that transitioned have now regretted it and come back, or is it still too early to say what the percentage will be? So we don't have the numbers, and there are a few reasons we don't know. Um, one of them is that there is no um, that, you know, there's no um, code, there's no insurance code for desistance when it comes to gender dysphoria mm. right now. Um, so there, there's no way of, of 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 marking for a physician to mark when someone stopped um, or desisted from um, claiming to have this gender dysphoria. At least as I've been told by um. Dr. Ray Blanchard, who I interviewed on mm. the book, um, but but there are other there are other reasons we, we're unable to track. When when a young woman comes to her doctor and says, or goes to Planned Parenthood and says, "I know I'm trans. I know I'm trans. I, I've had gender dysphoria all my life. Please give me the drugs right now." She, if she realizes she's made a mistake, she doesn't go back to the same doctor um, because it's very embarrassing. Mm. So they so mm. they tend to go to a new doctor to help them detransition. So the numbers are very hard to get. But if you look online, we do have reason to believe the numbers are exploding. And the reason is, is it when you look at like the most popular social media site for them. So when I wrote the book, there were 7000 members, I think, in the um, subreddit for detransitioners. Today, there are over 17000. Wow. So that's in less than a year. And um, and if you just look at YouTube and you see the young women who have given their testimonials, this is a burge. I mean, it, it, it's like every week there are more of these young women who come forward and say they regret it. Now, now remember, there's tremendous shame and embarrassment, um, unfortunately, in detransitioning. They're treated really badly by activists who ins who treat it as a kind of betrayal. Um, mm. So uh, there there are many reasons it's hard to get numbers on, but but we do, but it does look like it's it's fast growing and it will. It could be, you know, quite large. <laughs> well, when you say 17,000 members of a Reddit group, that doesn't mean there's 17,000 people that transition and then change and then revert it back. Do you? I mean, maybe. That's right. How do you know? No, no, no. Maybe they're just people that are just logging on for fun. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So we don't know, but there does seem to be a, a rapid growth of this population. Um, if you just look on the number of testimonials coming every, you know, every week to YouTube, it's a lot. Um, I mean, I, I certainly can't keep up with them. Um, and, and you're right that there, we can assume that there are some other people mixed in, but it's fair to, you know, to assume based on the posts and whatnot that a, you know, substantial portion of the members of that subreddit are detransitioners mm -hmm. themselves based on the questions they're asking and whatnot. And, and, and just look at YouTube, um, week to week and how many new people are coming forward to say that they regretted their transition and, and are now trying to go back. So your hypothesis is that the spike in uh, trans rates was due largely to, to so a social contagion driven by social media, and Facebook and, and whatnot. Now, the counter to that, I guess, is that they were always there and the diagnostic tools were not accurate enough and the opportunities to come out were not available. Now they are. This is the real number. OK, so there's several reasons why I don't think that's right. One of them is that Dr. Lisa Lippman, uh, then of Brown University, who did the original study, noticed that there was a 70 times the expected prevalence rate within friend groups. So and, and, and often these girls were coming out with their friend groups within a very short period of time. So an entire friend group would come out as trans. Sometimes 50 percent or more of the friend group would come out as trans. That's not what we would expect if trans, you know, or or um, gender dysphoria were normally naturally distributed among a population. There would be no reason we'd see such incredibly high concentration within friend groups. But there but there are other reasons as well. First of all, um, we are living in no doubt an easier time to come out as trans. I don't think anybody could could really doubt that. And yet you don't see women in their 40s, 50s, 60s suddenly coming out as trans. You only see the spike in the same population, the same age cohort that falls for every other social contagion that is particularly vulnerable to every social contagion. So we, we're not seeing greater societal acceptance and therefore, you know, more trans identification across all populations. We're seeing one population in particular spiking. Um, and then, you know, and then there are the rates of suicide when we look at these teen girls the suicide rates are going are shooting up, um, but one would think that if gender dysphoria and and society's reaction to trans identification were driving suicide rates, given that there's greater acceptance today, they should be going down. Right. Um, so I, I I really do think you know it, it is there, there's strong evidence that this is a socially driven phenomenon. I I think that's probably right. Uh, here I. I was thinking of, uh, I often quote David Hume's theory of causality, you know, constant conjunction, A happens, then B happens, A happens, then B happens. Now, that doesn't always work because the sun, ri you, know, the, the, you know, the rooster crows and the sun rises, clearly the rooster's not causing the sun to rise. But counterfactual definition of causality, you take A out and does, if B still happens, so you, you silence the rooster and the sun still rises, okay, the rooster was just a proxy for the sunrise, something else was going on. And uh, so here, if it, let's just as a thought experiment, let's just roll the clock back to 2007. And the iPhone's not invented, and Facebook d disappears, and, and and you take away that social media, then would you project? You you'd predict then that this would not have happened, or something not quite like this would have happened. Absolutely, absolutely. A couple things. First of all, Gene Twenge and 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 Jonathan Haidt and other academic psychologists have linked fairly precisely the incredible spike in self-harm, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation to the iPhone and social media, specifically for young girls. We know that teen girls are in terrible pain today. Okay, so without the iPhone, I don't think you get that, yeah. that spike in self-harm. Now, this is just, the, the teen trans identification, one way to see this is it's just one, me one manifestation of the mental health crisis teen girls are in. Yeah. OK, so it's one part of their effort to um, self-harm and one expression of the genuine pain they're in. Um, but there's something else, too. You know, I get calls all the time from parents and it, it depends. I, I still get them all the time and it depends on the age of the girl. But if she's younger and 13, 14 and they can take away her phone or they can isolate her from social media or they change schools very often they see tremendous improvement mm. and much more comfort in her body. 
So yeah, she goes back th- after yes, she's removed yes. from the environment. There's your counterfactual causality there. You take away uh, A and see what happens. So you, you, I think you had a story of parents that went and got her, their daughter out of this college and, and took her back home, and then she dropped the whole trans thing. That would be an example. Yeah. Right. It's it's harder. You know, the older a young woman gets, the harder it is to sort of shake her out of it, um, the more she she would need to come to it on her own. And I have seen that. I've seen young women who looked like they were absolutely going to stick with this. And then um, and I thought this is just going to be their life, who then at some point, um, you know, (laughs) often around 25, when they sort of reach, you know, brain maturity or whatnot, um, or, or maybe just other emotional maturity, they, they, um, they, they on their own have come back and said, you know what, this was a mistake. This is not who I am. Um, but, but once a young woman leaves for college, she often doesn't want to hear what her parents have to say about this. So it's, it's much harder for her parents to do anything to get through to her. I was going to cite this, uh, Supreme court decision, Roper versus Simmons, in 2005, landmark decision in which the Supreme Court of the United States held that it is unconstitutional to impose capital punishment for crimes committed while under the age of 18. Writing for the majority, Justice Kennedy cited a body of sociological and scientific research that found juveniles have a lack of maturity and sense of responsibility compared to adults. Adolescents were found to be overrepresented statistically in virtually every category of reckless behavior. The court noted that in recognition of the comparative immaturity and irresponsibility of juveniles, almost every state prohibited those under age 18 from voting, serving on juries, or marrying without parental consent. The studies also found that juveniles are more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures, including peer pressure. They have less control or experience with control over their own environment. They also lack the freedom that adults have to escape criminogenic, uh, a criminogenic setting. That's 2005. This is before all this happened. I, I believe that bears some uh, exa- yeah <laughs> relevance. Yeah, it does. I mean, I look. The, the question is not do human beings or, or you know adults or have a right to make ma- major drastic changes to their lives or even their bodies. You know, personally, I I think they have you know every right, and I would have no. I wouldn't have written this book if this were about adults making this decision. But but it's you know mature adults. Um, but but it's not. It's about make you know, young people who we have every reason to believe are the and 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 this psychologists have shown they are most susceptible to making decisions, making reckless decisions when they're when they th- when peer approval is on the line. That's what that's what teenagers specifically do, at and numbers far you know beyond what 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 we see with adults. So um it, it's that social a- aspect the idea that they're doing it for popularity for friendship for a sense of belonging you, you don't see that as much with adults they may get a tattoo but they they tend to do it for for personal reasons rather than you know to to please their friends uh just one last point on the the gene tank uh, twangy research uh there, w- there was some debate last year about whether it was screen time in general or very specific sites that were the most harmful to the women and i think they're leaning more and more toward recommending not just you know two hours a day maximum screen time that that's too global you need very specific sites that are causing the problem you know this is one of those things where it's so obvious that there's a connection between um young women spending all day staring at their images their own images online staring at how much approval their friends get versus them um staring at all the parties they haven't been invited to, you, you, you sort of, all you need is common sense to know that this might be um, a very ugly p- place for a young woman to be. And, and, and to, and I think it's our only our own, you know, all of our addiction to these, um, you know, devices and also, you know, these s- social media platforms that keeps us from being, you know, more obvious, you know, honest about it. Now, I say that as someone who uses Twitter. I mean, I'm as reliant on a mm-hmm. lot of these things as anybody else. I don't I don't remotely hold myself out as as, as better in, in those respects. But I think that if we're being honest about the welfare of young women, uh, it's played an awfully negative role. And you've seen that from bullying and suicide from, you know, just really just, you know, you, you see young women who've been absolutely tormented by these 
technologies and, and social media platforms. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I, when I first heard about FOMO and FOBLO, fear of missing out, fear of being left out, I thought, well, this is a silly thing teens go through or whatever. And then when COVID hit uh, and no one was traveling anywhere, and I realized I was kind of relieved to be home knowing that no one else was going anywhere either in the sense that like I used to give like maybe a dozen public talks a year and I'd see my, my peers and friends like Richard Dawkins and Steven Pinker and, and others get invited to these conferences or given these awards. And I think, Oh, my, my buddy Steve won this award. Wait a minute. How come I wasn't invited to that conference? Hey, why wasn't I able to, you know, and I could sense in myself like, eh, come on, Shermer, don't be so competitive, you know? And, and then now no one's going anywhere and I'm kind of, happy about it. It's like, oh, good. <laughs> and so, you know, FOMO is not just for teenagers. I mean, it's kind of, it's just sort of there. And I wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for Twitter, but I can't, I can't get off because, you know, it's, it's a platform where we all communicate. So I can see how that could happen. You know, and I'm 66. I could, if I was 16, I'd probably, you know, be falling apart over these things. Um, since you, you, you got a little personal in your book, Abigail, maybe you could tell us what it's like to, to be a teenage girl in high school. And how this could, how that could lead sure. to something like I, this. Sure. I think that, you know, a lot of women have told me when they read my book and, and also, you know, as interviewing various people, you know, being a young woman is hard. Um, I think it's, it's uniquely hard. Um, first of all, cause your body changes in ways that are so radical compared to boys. Um, you know, um, it's not just secondary sex characteristics, but all of a sudden, you know, from the moment you develop breasts, men your father's age start noticing you. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling for a girl who's 13 or 14 and is not certainly not feeling that sexual attraction to, you know, much older men and, and yeah. certainly not and not always prepared to handle it either. Um, but also, you know, in all of a sudden, those boys you used to, you know, be able to beat in soccer or at least give them a run for their money now are much, much stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 of course, you know, just menses is a very uncomfortable. I mean, I used to have to go to the nurse's office with terrible cramps, and that's a very common phenomenon. It's not fun to go through female puberty. It's a, mm. it's a really agonizing process. Mm. Um, but what we used to have were girlfriends and girlfriends we saw in person. And that made it much easier because we would talk to them about all these things. Today, young women bring all their troubles to the internet. They bring in them to Google when they have a question. And part of the reason they do that, and, and this Jean Twenge's work has been excellent, is they spend so much less time with each other in person. Mm. See, even when they are in person, by the way, they're on their phones. So they, the, 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 sort of the person they confide in is not another person. Um, very often, unfortunately, it's the internet, it's Google, it's and, and, and whatnot. And, and so they, they take their questions, their worries about themselves, their worries about a bodies to a place that is really unkind, really unforgiving and, and potentially full of misinformation and a lot of, you know, um, a bad, bad advice from, from influencers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned in the book that um, when you hit puberty and your breasts developed and you were uncomfortable with their size and you were thinking of getting breast reduction surgery and your dad said, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> now, to your credit, you didn't disown him and quit talking to him or whatever. And, and you said you were glad that, that he imposed that on you because that's what parents are supposed to do. What was bothering bothersome in your book was all these kids that just go, well, in that case, I'm never speaking to you again or I'm going to commit suicide if you don't go along with this. That's that's pretty hard to hear as a parent. You know, alienation, every time I talk to psychologists, they tell me that alienation is a real thing, that that you're seeing so much family alienation, both encouraged and driven by other psychologists, um, and, and that it's very much, and also, of course, encouraged by peer groups and influencers. And that is, if your parents aren't allies, if they don't immediately support these drastic medical interventions, cut them off. You know, choose your glitter family over mm. them. It's 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 the thing that parents point to when they say that it's it was like their daughters enter a, entered a cult. That's the word yeah. that parents often use um, because they, they say she started reciting these mantras that didn't seem like her. And also that she was so intolerant, she would cut us off if we didn't say the right thing. Um, and, and we see that a lot in America. I mean, even over politics, of course, you, you know, there was a lot of talk around Thanksgiving about if you're a parent, you know, in the New York Times or in that article and right. uh, you know, all this talk about if your parents don't, you know, if you have someone in your family who supports Trump, cut them off. 
you know, you know um, uh, and that is that is something people do today. Terrible. No, one of the one of the seven Republicans who voted for impeachment. There was a story yesterday that not only is are his constituents back in his home state disowning him, his own family says we're not speaking to him again. Your family? Oh my God! Come on. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a parent, and, you know, there's nothing worse than your kid getting mad at you or say, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. It's just, you know, I can't imagine hearing, or I'm going to commit suicide if you don't support me. I mean, that would be really hard to not then want to bend. Like, well, no, I don't want you to kill yourself. My God. Right, we're adopting the binary Manichaean world of online communication and online friendship. So you don't agree with me, you're unfriended, you are banished. I mean, that's how we're now treating family. Um, it's, it's, it's really unhealthy, I think. And of course, you know, the parents who go through this, and I interviewed a lot of them, most of them were politically progressive, but I have no doubt based on the parents that I interviewed that w- when these girls, you know, if and when some of these girls get themselves into trouble of various kinds, either they regret their transition, they wanna go back, they're unhappy or whatever, it's the parents who were there for them, not the teachers who celebrated them, the, the the therapists who pushed this, or the doctors who happily oblige, but the parents. Um, right, right. It, it's very dangerous, you know, that they're all being cut off. That funny story. Or so of many the, are being cut of, off. of the mother telling you that uh, uh, her daughter told her her attitudes are toxic, but she still wants the tuition paid by the parents. So the mother says, I guess my money's not toxic. <laughs> Now, it seems to me there's a legal issue here. If you're un- if it's an underage child, under 18, the parent can impose some pretty draconian rules or whatever, do whatever they want, essentially, to protect them from, say, dangerous cults. Let's use that as an example. But once you're off to college, you're 18, you're an adult, you're legal. Uh, and there, there were cases in the 90s, I remember we covered these, where there was this group called the Cult Awareness Network, CAN, that helped, or there was a branch of them that helped organize going to get one of the, these adult children out of a cult. Well, this is pretty risky legally because they would, because the, the person that is in the cult, they don't think they're in a cult. They're, they're happy to be there. And so all of a sudden the parents show up and go, we're taking you away. It's like, no, you're not. Oh, yes, we are. And they would hire these big goons to whisk them off in a car and put them in a hotel room for a couple of weeks until they, you know, deprogram them. And it's like, Whoa. I mean, there were some really serious legal issues there. And then and then Cult Awareness Network got sued into oblivion by Scientology, who then took them over. And then so people would call Cult Awareness Network and say, I think my child's in this cult called Scientology. We can help you with that. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, the age of medical consent varies by state. So in Oregon, you can walk into a clinic at 15 without your parents' permission and start testosterone. And you don't have to be 18 to get your breasts removed, depending on the doctor. Really? Um, and That's yes, amazing. Really. I that, mean, that's amazing. It is that's- amazing. It really is. Yeah, it, it, it really is. But also in colleges, I, I've talked to parents and, and they know the drill from from the support groups that they have, that there have been parents who've shown up in college because they were getting strange texts from their daughter. They thought her mental health might be going haywire. And they showed up to find out who their daughter, you know, what was going on, why why she had suddenly started testosterone and was she OK? And they were escorted off campus. Mm. And that absolutely happened. Um, it's not easy to get your daughter back from this when she's really in the throes of it. Um, and 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 by in the throes, I mean this insistent and urgent need to transition right now, um, which which is you know what parents uh, testify to or, or talk about. Yeah. Frankly, young women talk about it too. I mean, I've interviewed adolescents who've said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I always say no one. No one ever joins a cult in the history of the world. They join a group they think is is good. Just, we're going to help. We're going to save the world. I'm going to improve my life. Whatever. Uh, it's only gradually down the line when you've gone so far, and it's just like, no, I'm not doing that. And then you realize I've gone too far. Well, um, okay. So let's talk about these steps of transitioning. The binding is bad enough. At least you can take the binder off. Uh, but still, apparently, even binding, you know, squashing your breast does some physical damage, right? 
That's that's right. I mean, sometimes, you know, men talk about breasts as if they're, you know, you, you hear this sometimes, you know, sort of casual talking about breasts as if they're nothing. And I interviewed, you know, um, you know, plastic surgeons in the book. Breasts are complicated structures. They're not meant to be squashed down all day. So you, 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 you know, they have ducts. And, and, and lobes and whatnot. So they, you, you do see some deformation of breast tissue, rib cracking. I mean, these binders are very, very tight. These are the compression garments um, girls start, often start with when they decide to become trans um, or decide that they really are trans is, is usually how they put it. Um, and then the next step is typically testosterone. Yeah. Yeah, I know that... Uh... That I, a, a, a oncologist friend of mine tells me that you know when a woman has to get a double mastectomy because of breast cancer, this is psychologically pretty catastrophic. I mean, it's really devastating. It's a huge, huge thing. Or when when women get the double mastectomy, if they have that genetic, I forget what the gene the gene is that, that they're going to get breast yeah. cancer very likely. That it's it's pretty dramatic to do that. To think that girls are doing this optionally for no reason at all, other than I don't want to have breasts because I I want to be a boy. That is really huge. I really find it hard to believe that that you could do that under the age of eighteen. Yeah, yes, and remember that traditionally, when when adults wanted to transition, therapists mm-hmm. would insist they live as the opposite gender without physical alteration for a period of time, one or two years. Because it's very hard to present as the opposite sex and that we didn't want to do these surgeries for someone who might regret it, even mature adults. So they would do this process and the person would say, look, it's been two years. I'm really sure. And then and then they would, you know, go through the physical alterations. And there was safety in that because we don't want to be performing these these operations, which are so dramatic on someone who might who might for whom it would be unnecessary harm. Remember those programs, the scared straight programs, where they bring in ex-drug addicts to scare the crap out of teenagers for drugs? It's almost like we need a group of these post-transitioners that show these surgeries and and, and the dramatic changes to people that are thinking about it, or just to everybody. Just have a school assembly. In case you're thinking about this, this is what it's actually entailed. I mean, your section on how to, uh, again, phalloplasty, how to build a penis. How do you build a penis? Well, didn't you say they use a portion of the forearm? And then you got the plumbing down there because it's a waste disposal system also. And that gets infected. So you got to run this tube outside of it and then put it back in. And this just goes on and on. And you end up with something like just a little carrot dangling there that doesn't really work. I mean, to what extent are you really a male by doing that? How is that possibly making you feel masculine? Not to mention the medical risks are huge. Right. Well, right. Most of these girls aren't actually looking to be male. So that that was the sort of one of the things I learned in the course of writing the book. What they're looking to do is escape womanhood, which is something that has occurred to women probably <laughs> since the dawn of time to want to escape it, especially during the, the really awkward years, um, because they don't act like traditional men and they don't take up the habits of men. You don't see them suddenly love football or watch football or or, you know, you, you <laughs> right. don't see them acting like men. Um, they, you see them acting as people who don't want to be seen as women, women anymore. Okay. Um, and so yet, yeah, yeah, you're the, the, the phalloplasty look, I've, I've been told by plastic surgeons that, that for the rare experts who are really, really good at the surgery, it can be done. Um, it can be done well. I mean, through a series of surgeries, if, if you want it to actually be able to penetrate and, um, and, and stiffen and then penetrate all these are, are very difficult achievements for a surgeon. But, but assuming it's all done, you know, by the absolute experts, I've been told it can be done well, but, but the, the unbelievable, you know, legion, you know, of, of you know, ways that it can go wrong. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really something it's, it's not, you know, um, an easy surgery and the detransitioners are all over the internet. Um, including, you know, women who've had fat, uh, botched phalloplasties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the other flaw in this, if I just take T, testosterone, I'll be more masculine or I'll become masculine. My voice will go and secondary sex characteristics and so on. But the problem with this is that there's it, it's, it treats it as like it's just one dial. It, it's not one dial. It just it's, Think of those sound boards you see in recording studios where they have, you know, just like hundreds and hundreds of dials. I don't even know what they all do. But those guys know what they do. And it's like taking, well, I'm just going to crank this one up, you know, the bass. And, and that'll, 
that'll make me this. No, it, it isn't like that. And I know this because I'm a, I've been an athlete my whole life. And so, you know, if I just take testosterone, then this will happen. There's like 20 other things that'll happen when you dial this one up, then this is going to do this and this is going to do that. And, it, you know, but, you know, in, in the related subject of uh, uh, males transitioning to females and then entering female sports, I know this isn't what your book is about, but but this is a problem because they think, well, I've just stopped taking, I, I, I took testosterone blockers and a few other things. That's not enough. You're still a man. I mean, everything just down to the size of your bones, the bone density, the size of your heart, the VO2 uptake and lung capacity, the size of your arteries and tendons and ligaments and muscles. It's not just the one thing. So you get chest hair, chest hair. Well, I have chest hair, but I know guys that don't have any chest hair. They're not less masculine than me. Or, you know, I see Dave Rubin. He's got the best head of hair I've ever seen. I wish I had his head of hair, but he's not more manly cause, than me because he's got more hair. And if you got Joe Rogan, he doesn't have any hair and he's even more masculine than Dave and me put together. I mean, these are, it's so simplified. Like if I just do this one thing, then this is going to happen. No. And, and the one reason I never doped when I was a cyclist was because I was afraid if I tweak this one thing here, I'm going to fuck up the whole system. And then 20 years later, I'm going to have cancer or whatever. I, you know, there, this still has not been proved, but it could be. It's, it's a risky thing to do is what I'm saying. And that even that, well, I'll just take tea and that'll be that. No, it's not going to do what you think it does. And you don't know the long-term consequences. I, I interviewed a, a really brilliant young detransitioner um, who goes by the name Jade. It was actually a biological male who had transitioned and regretted it. And one of the things he said, he said he was presented with this such, this robotic view of the body by his doctor. It was just like, oh, you could just remove this or just start this. And he started, you know, he had a terrible time with transition and t really regretted it, thought it was just the result of a really rough time he was going through psychologically and um, that had even led him to this. But but he said, you know, I, I didn't realize you can't just go around removing body parts. It's all connected, as, right. as you say. Um and, and, and too often it, it is you get this robotic view of, oh, I'll just remove the breasts. I'll just add hormones. They don't shower the brain or anything. They won't, you know, and, and of course, you know, it is all connected. Um, so, so, I mean, I interviewed, you know, forensic anthropologists for the book who talked to me at this, about the slope of a forehead, meaning, you know, men have a different ridge on their forehead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, our bones are different, which means that it's a real uphill battle presenting as the opposite sex. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm worried about Title IX, women's rights, and sports and society when men can just say, "Well, I'm a woman now," and even if they, you know, really do identify as a woman and they've taken the test, the hormones, the blockers and whatnot for a year. Apparently, that's the rule now for the NAA. No, sorry, the NC. One of those college sports set a rule of like you have to do it for a year and then you can enter as a woman. But when you see them, it's clearly they're not women. They're they're much larger. Their bones are bigger. I mean, they just have just the just the amount of strength you get from having bigger tendons here than a woman would have. And and that's not going to change in a year or two. It may never change. That, that's right. The there are organizational effects of of testosterone that occur during puberty, and they confer a permanent advantage, even if you lower activational hormones in the body later. You're not, you're not, you can't undo the permanent lifetime effects of larger hearts, as you said, larger bones, more muscle mass, more fast twitch muscle fiber. There are so many physical differences between men and women. Um, and, and those don't get undone. So it really is, uh, you know, they're, I, I don't think they're being terribly honest when they say, oh, well, we'll just lower the, you know, activational or bioactive levels of testosterone in the body. Yeah. Um, as you say. Yeah. Last year there was that um, master's track championship, uh, the, the man who entered as a woman and identifies as a woman. She's a professor, Rachel McKinnon, right? I think you mentioned Rachel McKinnon in your book. Uh, so I follow that story pretty closely cause I'm a, a bike racer and, and, uh, you know, it's just clearly not fair. It's not the same. And, and the two women she beat that year that were on the podium with her, uh, you know, one objected, the other one, you know, wanted to be supportive of trans rights. And it's like, that's not the issue. We're all supportive of rights. Universal human rights and a story. Now, let's talk about the actual difference. There's a difference, and it's just not fair. Now, bike racing is one thing. I think it was Joe Rogan makes the point, you know, in MMA fighting, if one of these guys enters a women's division and kills one of these women, that's going to 
that'll be a game changer. That'll end this this issue. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of young girls get very hurt, especially in the more contact sports. Um, but you know, if 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 this continues, I mean, you know, I I I think that the you know biological males and female sports issue is one of the dumbest issues of all time because the it, it's so obvious the difference. And we sit here and debate it like it's a, you know, a, a complicated, you know, theoretical question. It actually is incredibly simple and we all know it. It's just a question of who's afraid to say so. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at someone like Serena Williams, I mean, she's just massively more athletic than the women tennis players, say, the 70s, like, uh, I don't know who, uh, Chrissy Everett, something like that. And yet she herself says the hundredth place guy in the world would beat me. And, 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 you know, it's like yeah. there's a reason there's men's and women's divisions. Now, maybe there's not enough trans for there to be a trans division. That would be an easy solution. Uh, but then you'd have to have male to female trans versus male to female. The opposite. Sorry. Uh, but maybe there's just not enough to have a, a full Olympic division for that or, or, or college sports, something like that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people look at the numbers and they say there aren't that many transgender kids. So there's no reason for the moral panic. Who cares if the number one, two and three spots go to biological boys? OK, well, first of all, there's obviously the incredible unfairness of fixing the race for for a number, you know, spots one, two and three telling girls, oh, you'll never, ever, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you train, you will never be number one. You will never make regionals. Right. You will never. I mean, that's that's a very different yeah. prospect for young yeah. women, but also they're entitled to it. I mean, these are rights that were given to women. They were sex based rights that were recognized for women. And then the idea that we just give them away because this other group is is claiming, you know, they for various reasons, they would like to participate in that. Uh, that that doesn't seem to be a basis for for, you know, just tossing out women's rights. Yeah. Yeah, it does make a difference whether I mean, this is the reason doping is prohibited in sports, because, um, it, you know, it does provide an unfair advantage. And to the people that don't do it and, it, it, and it's not like, well, he had one percent over me. It, you know, it's so rampant, at least it was in cycling, that you actually absolutely had to do it or else you can't even compete. And, and 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 therefore, you know, the guy who wins who got that slight advantage, and then he he gets big sponsorships, and he you know, and so forth, you know, and it trickles down down the line. And you made that one decision: I'm not going to dope. And then you go down this other path that's completely different. I guess I can't compete, and that changes your life. And that's what that's why it's unfair. And again, back to this, you know, single dial. Uh, and you, you know, I used to do this race across America, the 3,000 mile transcontinental bike race in the 80s. And then in the 90s, I ran it. I was the race director. So I hired UCLA lab, to, a, a doping testing lab to test all our, our, our cyclists. And one of the women came back with a very high testosterone level. And they go, well, you know, she's practically a man based on this definition that we have in college sports of what your upper T level could be. And what do you want to do about it? I'm like, nothing. I know who she is. And, you know, she's like in the middle of the women's field. She's not like going to beat all the men or anything like that. And it's like, because it, it's not just the one thing. You looked at her and she's obviously a woman. And she doesn't look like a guy. You know, it's like the test. Again, it's just too simple. High testosterone. Okay. There's natural variation. She's a little on the high side. But so what? It's not like she has chest hair and has a deep voice with a beard. No, not, not even close. And then the second story from that era I had two women in uh, in 1993, 94, and 95. They were so good, they were beating most of the men. Uh, Shauna Hogan and, and Muffy Ritz in particular, uh, they led the entire field for like the first 800 miles of Race Across America from L.A. all the way to into Colorado. And the guys were like, holy crap, what is going on here? <laughs> and then there was talk, you know, amongst all the officials and the crews and stuff, maybe we should just have a single field just one field no men's and women and uh and so i remember talking to the women about that and they're like no 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 we like just having a women's division because you know we think this may not be what we think it is and sure enough like after two thousand miles then the men were were quite a ways ahead of uh, uh, a couple of the men were ahead of them they still finished fairly high and then i remember one of them complained to me that uh, you know this is a non-stop race you, you, you if you stop you, you're just losing time to the other competitors if you got to go pee or whatever well, the men can pee off the bike if you have a slight 
downhill or maybe a tailwind. You just pull your shorts down and you just pee and, you know, you're in the middle. We're on these country roads. There's no one around. No one cares. But the women, they have to get off to pee. So that they lose like five minutes every two hours, right? So one of them was complaining to me. I want, maybe we should have like a deduction off my overall time for the number of times I peed. It's like, well, then you want to compete with the men. No, no, I don't. I want to be in the women's division. I said, well, the other women have to get off the bike to pee too. <laughs> so that's the, the, there are physical differences between men and women. And that's why we have those divisions in sports. <laughs> a funny story. Things you have to deal with as a race director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, there, there are all kinds of differences. I mean, you know, sometimes people ask, did this problem come up because in part we've been denying, you know, feminists have been de- denying for years that there were any significant physical differences between biological males and females. And I think there's some truth to that, meaning, you know, I, I tend to think it's a bad idea when you start fudging the truth. Yeah. Um, and and especially in the public sphere, because there are unintended consequences. And when they wanted to assert, you know, you know, women, you know, that women should have the opportunity to participate in all kinds of, you know, things from military to police force and whatnot in combat, they 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 very often when we talked about in the public sphere, they would they would sort of fudge the physical differences in aptitude and ability. And I, I I don't think it's a good idea to to go down the road of not being honest about anything, frankly, um, because I do think you end up in a um, in a situation where you're encouraging an idea of, oh, if there are no real physical differences, it'd be easy to switch. Um, it, it's not easy. It's it's a uh, the, the differences are quite profound. And and even switching the appearance turns out to involve a, a, lot, a great deal of of medical risk. So in the L.A. Review of Books review of your book, I'm going to read some of this because it's really hard to believe somebody could write this kind of stuff. The author's incantation of the First Amendment does not sufficiently emphasize her red-blooded passion for true democracy, but for the seductive image of a hermetically sealed and patriarchally sound America, one regressively nostalgic for mid-century convention, order, and heroism. Irreversible damage is Schreier's own simpering cry to make America great again. Oh my God, he's... She's invoking Trump. <laughs> why do you bring up the first? Yeah, am- you bring it's up very the first- silly, you know. Yeah, go ahead. You bring up the First Amendment in your first chapter. Explain why why you did that. Yeah, I brought up the First Amendment because I'm a lawyer, and because that's how I got into this topic. I actually just wrote a piece about pronoun laws, the laws in California and New York. Oh, yeah. I wrote a not bad for the Wall Street Journal that then those um, states have laws that mandate criminal and civil penalties for failing to use someone's preferred. Gender, And so I wrote an op-ed and said, this is straightforwardly unconstitutional under the First Amendment. You know, we're, there's really clear precedent that in America, the government can't make you say anything, not please and thank you, not anything for the sake of politeness. They can't even the government can't even make you salute the flag in America. So making you use someone's correct pronouns is just unconstitutional. And a reader saw that and wrote to me and, and she told me the story of her daughter who had gotten caught up in this. She was a girly girl who'd gone off to college and all of a sudden with a gr- gr- group of girlfriends, the girl had a, yada, a lot of mental health problems, always had trouble fitting in. But she went off to college and with a group of girlfriends, they all decided they were trans and started a course of testosterone. And the mother told me no journalist would take this up, that she had written to every journalist she could. Mm. And when I tried to pass it off um, to an investigative reporter, I, I found out she was right, that that people did not want to touch this issue. Um, you know, so as for the L.A. Review of Books, I, did, I, I you know, I didn't even know they existed. Um, I. I I don't know what to make of that review, except that it, you know. Yeah, I should be um, clear. It's not the L.A. Times. You know, it, it's not the L.A. Times. It's its own thing. Uh, oh. Yeah. No, oh, it's, it's its own thing. Yeah, okay. it's its own thing. It's uh, People confuse that. It's almost like the New York Review of Books is not the New York Times book review. People get, right. the, get those confused. But but just to give listeners a sample of the kind of language and, 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 and the way um, uh, this culture thinks, this woman's name is Sarah Vanesca. I'd never heard of her. She continues her review of your book. What follows this moment of duplicitous soapbox oration is the full-fledged gender panic of the book itself, so ugly and corporeally invasive of trans men and even cis women. In my feminist naivete, I was shocked to observe this self-identified woman writer choosing to maim rather than bask in what the policies that protect trans people stand to offer her in the way of gender breathing room. 
a world where one's totality is affirmed no matter one's appearance, a world where her body's medical needs can be met even if she is incarcerated. Instead, Shira chooses to double down on her black and white political beliefs and even her own gender throughout. Gender, that complex amalgam that the late trans historian Jan Morris once described so tenderly, quote, It is soul, perhaps it is talent, it is taste, it is environment, it is how one feels, it is light and shade, it is inner music, it is the essentialness of oneself, close quote. But all Schreier can see is her own eminent extinction as a white, conservative, cisgender woman in this nation under overdue strain. (laughs) And then finally she quotes you and then says, As Shriver's worst fears are articulated, it becomes clear that this new wave of anti-trans activism is largely made up of cisgender women whose chokehold on victim identity exceeds anything ever seen in queer and trans community. So, Abigail, are you just a white cisgender woman uh, afraid that your chokehold on victimhood status is being taken away by some other victim group? You, you know, um, this is what the the attackers do. They never actually touch any of the arguments in the book, never any of the facts, never any of the studies, of which there are many, many cited. Um, it's all just an attack, an ad hominem attack on me. Now, I kept politics out of the book. I kept it out of the book yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Um, I don't think they have any place. This was an investigation of a medical phenomenon, which I wanted to know why girls were doing this. Um, I, I had no political. And in fact, to this day, I don't have policy prescriptions for how this should be handled, what medication should be available or when. I just simply investigated and found that a lot of girls were suddenly identifying. It didn't seem to be traditional gender dysphoria. It seemed to be socially influenced. And I pointed out when I did my investigation, I learned that there were very few um, medical safeguards in place for these girls in case they were wrong about their self diagnoses. So that's, that's all the book is. Um, and, and there's actually, you know, if you read it, there's very little to take issue with. Um, so perhaps that's why they all feel the need to attack me personally. Um, but, but, you know, there's nothing in the book the book has been read over by many men, you know, medical, not only doctors and, um, experts in gender dysphoria, but no one has found any factual error in the book or, or any, you know, political claim or anything like that. uh, One of them said you talk to mostly parents, but not the kids themselves. But, but you did, you did talk to some teenagers, right? Absolutely. That's one of the things they just made up and started reasserting. So it's something that gets said, but of course, of course I talked to adolescents and um, I talked to both, you know, those who had gone through this and regretted it and those who were still trans identifying. What I what I didn't do was I didn't do it without parental permission. Mm. I'm not going to I, I'm not someone who's going to talk to your teenage girl, daughter without your permission. Yeah. I just don't I don't think that's ethical. No. Um, no. Un- unfortunately, those on the other side do that all the time, including the doctors. So they will talk to them about um, your, you know, oh, you're 14 years old. Tell me, do you have suicidal thoughts? To me, this is just not ethical behavior. And without you know parental permission, I would never do that. So I didn't do that. Um, but yes, of course, I talk to adolescents. Another thing they say about me all the time is she, you know, this woman who's not even a mother herself and blah, blah, blah. They just make stuff up. I am, I am as it happens, a mother. <laughs> but but they just make stuff up and it gets recirculated. Yeah, um, yeah. But. Yeah, I noticed that when uh, Barry Weiss came to your defense, then they attacked Barry Weiss. And it's like, you know, Barry is a yeah. a woman. B from an oppressed minority. She's Jewish. C she's gay. Oh no, that's not enough, right? You check three of the boxes. It's still not enough. Yeah, I, this you know I don't you know I this identitarian you know obsession with what what our categories are is not is not really helping our ability to have clear discussions about anything. Um, unfortunately, so you know. Um, anyway, that's where a lot of the attacks come from on me. Yeah. Well, and then you had that the business with Target pulling your book for sale and they put it back in, I think, after you wrote the Wall Street Journal piece. Uh, what's the status now of its sales? It's available everywhere. And uh, I don't think a- Amazon tried it's to block it. It's available everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Amazon did. Amazon blocked, um, you know, the sale of, uh, sorry, the, um, the ads for my book from the very get go. So if you typed in search words for my book, Amazon would helpfully suggest an 
another book, um, one of the you know hundreds or so that promote you know gender transition for for teenagers. Um, and and you know this kind of you know there were the the attempts to censor my book from the ACLU lawyer calling for its you know banning and and whatnot have been legion. And I think um, I think you know it, this is part of the integrity crisis we're in in America. I mean. You know, when the world's largest bookstore says that it's the world's largest bookstore, except we won't allow ads for that book based on an ad hoc policy, that's not really integrity. And when Kirkus, which reviews, you know, 10,000 10, titles a year, won't review my book, that's not really that's not really acting with tech integrity. So um, and unfortunately, we're, we're seeing that all over the place. Kirkus didn't review your book. No, and they have 10,000 titles, including self-published and obscure works no one's ever heard of in my right. book, which, you know, be became a bestseller, was not was not reviewed by Kirkus because they were so afraid someone might actually read it. Yeah. Yeah, that's disturbing. Back to the free speech, open conversation we have to have about these things. Um, one of your uh, interview subjects or somebody said something like, well, oh, no, you called them up for an interview and they said, well, didn't you write for the Wall Street or some conservative paper or something like that, as if that uh, disqualifies you from uh, being talked, spoken to. Uh, I, I didn't get from the book at all your politics. Uh, I think I'll just not ask because it isn't relevant. Um, you know, so what if you write for the Wall Street Journal? I've written for the Wall Street Journal. So what? I mean, they have a huge circulation. It's great to what, you know, two, three million readers. Okay, good. Uh, instead, I'll turn to uh, a passage from my book, The, the Moral Arc, in the section on uh, uh, gay rights. I have a whole chapter on gay rights. By the way, I wrote this in 2014, so this was before the whole trans thing took off. I did talk about LGBT, but I didn't meant talk about T because it was really a non-event still there. But here I lean on Jonathan Rausch. I think you must know Jonathan Rausch and his uh, work in, in uh, defending free speech, but he's also a gay guy, right? So he, he, he writes this book, Gay Marriage. What it, why it is good for gays, good for straights, and good for America. And he, uh, on a book tour, he recalls the comment of a caller to a radio talk show he was on, in which, um, so he continues here, your guest, he said, meaning me, is the most dangerous man in America. Why? Because, said the caller, he sounds so reasonable. In hindsight, uh, Jonathan continues, this may be the greatest compliment I've ever been paid. It is certainly amongst the most sincere. Despite the caller's best efforts to shut out what I was saying, the debate he was hearing and the contrast between me and my adversary was working on him. I doubt he changed his mind that day, but I could tell he was thinking almost against his will. Hannah Arant once wrote, Truth carries within itself an element of coercion. The caller felt that he was in some sense being forced to see merit in what I was saying. And then I pick up the narrative here. Once again, we see here a powerful restatement of the principle of interchangeable perspectives in which the use of reason in an open dialogue forces us to consider the merit of what the other person is saying. And if the other person makes sense, their superior ideas gradually chip away at our prejudices. Coupled with the overwhelming scientific evidence that homosexuality is not a choice but a part of human nature, we see in this rights revolution another example of how science and reason lead humanity toward truth, justice, and freedom. And the change in a attitude supports my contention that many moral issues are in part debates over facts and that many immoral beliefs are just factual errors. While acknowledging that homophobic emotions have fueled attitudes toward gays over the past century, Jonathan Rausch notes that the deeper problem was that people held incorrect beliefs about homosexuals. He quotes, I'm quoting him here, factual misapprehensions and moral misjudgments born of ignorance, superstition, taboo, disgust. If people think you're a threat to their children or their family, they're going to fear and hate you. Gay's most urgent need was epistemological, not political. We had to replace bad ideas with good ones. Man, that's good. I love that guy. He's got a new wow. book coming out on truth, which I, I can't wait to read. Because, <laughs> uh, again, this idea of silence, appeal, we're going to get Target to pull your book. Why? What, 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 if she's got something wrong, state what's wrong with it. <laughs> and she's not passing moral judgments. She's defended human, universal human rights and, and free speech and so on. What is it you object to? Say it. Yeah, they're afraid people might actually read it and, and decide for themselves. That's what they're so afraid of, um, because it is very reasonable because they're the, the position on the other side is so unreasonable. It's so unreasonable to say 
that that for this specific condition, um, teenagers can self-diagnose and the doctor just follows their orders and pr- pr- provides whatever medication they demand. That's so unreasonable. Mm-hmm. It's so unreasonable to say that a you know 15 year old in Oregon, Oregon would have, don't worry about what other mental health problems they have. Don't worry about, you know, there's no mental health professional that even needs to sign off on that. Immediately agree that she needs testosterone and start, you know, show her how to inject herself. That's just so unreasonable that there would be no safeguards for this. Um, and that's all the book, you know, points out. Um, and and I, I think that's why they can't allow a conversation because the moment they allow the conversation, I think I win. Um, I, I win because you're, you're having the conversation in the first place. Right. Yeah. Men's health review of your book, uh, described Schreier's comments as quote, invalidating the lived experience of trans and non-binary kids and teens. This idea of the lived experience, this is not a reliable, uh, method to good knowledge. It's not because our experiences are so biased, especially if you're 15. Right. You don't know what the world's like. You don't even know what you're who you are. Right. Talk to any anorexic. I mean, she's pretty sure that if she just lost more weight, everything would would be great in her life. Um, or, or someone who's obsessed with her nose and just so badly, need, you know, is obsessed with the idea that if she got some more and more plastic surgery, you know, you see people with body dysmorphic disorder if they're obsessed with the idea if they get more and more plastic surgery, then everything in their life will be solved. And the problem is you leave this up to teenagers and very often, not only are they going to misdiagnose, they're not, they have, they're not doctors, but they're, they are tend to, to believe that things that their friends would agree with, things that will make them more popular, will be the thing that solves all the problems in their lives. And they're simply wrong about that. Yes. <laughs> and if somebody doesn't tell them you're wrong about that, then they're not going to know. This is why you can't work in isolation. You know, all the quacks that I deal with, the pseudoscientists, stuff, they always work in isolation. Well, I'm Galileo here figuring out the universe on my own. And Einstein was wrong and Newton was wrong and I've got it all figured out. I'll share the Nobel Prize with you if you help me with the math. It's like, you got the wrong dude. It's called Skeptic Magazine for a reason. <laughs> but the problem is, is, you know, did you talk to the like the local physics teacher, high school physics teacher? Because, you know, probably this has all been worked out, you know, centuries ago and, and you just don't know. You got to engage with other people. You know, working in isolation is one of the worst things you could do, you know, and, uh, and, and in part is, you know, okay, go ahead. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. And 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 I think, uh, you know, what makes this issue complicated is that everyone's bought in. So teachers affirm a young child who says they're, you know, out of nowhere that they're transgender. OK, what is your new name? Let's keep it from your parents. I mean, that's policy at, at yeah. schools. Um, let's let's come up with a new name, but we'll keep it private. Just us. And the therapists affirm them. Oh, you're definitely a boy. Let's just keep it. This is what's called affirmative therapy. It means immediately agree with the patient, no matter her age or her other, you know, the context of her sudden epiphany. Um, that's, you know, what that does is that eliminates medical judgment, therapeutic judgment. And, and, um, and, and unfortunately, we're seeing in this, in a young crop of activist doctors even, who start from the idea that you must affirm. So they effectively start with the conclusion, I know this person's trans. And then they, the only question is, how do we get there? What, what medications do we start with and how much? Right. That's not how medicine or science has ever been done before. No. In the middle of the satanic panic in the late 80s, um, Carol Tavris, my my friend, the social psychologist, I don't know if you know Carol, uh, but she, she's really great. She actually wrote an op-ed piece in the LA Times, Believe the Children. And then she retracted that later because the, 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 the theory was at the time, particularly around the McMartin preschool case uh, down the street from you in, in Manhattan Beach, that there was this satanic cult, and the and the more this they, they talked to the kids, the the grander the story got, all the way to the point where they had like a secret tunnel that went out to Catalina Island, where they were sacrificing horses and drinking the blood of children, and it just went on and on, and 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 no one stopped to ask, are these kids just making this up? And the and, and adults would go, well, kids would never make up something like that. Are you kidding me? Kids make up stuff all the time. This is fantasy. This is what they do. And I see I have a little five year, almost five year old, and I see him playing with his toys and he's got a whole story in his head. This little guy here is doing this and he says this and he's, he's got this whole world in his head at, at not even five. All right. So when these kids and then they're guided by the adults even worse, like here's the little anatomically correct doll. 
point to where he touched you. Not were you touched, but show us where he touched you. And by the way, they took the mommy. He's in the room by himself with strangers, and his mommy's in the other. You can see your mommy once you tell us where he touched you. And at some point, the kid goes, all right, he touched me there. Thank you very much. That's now evidence. Right? So the idea that you should just believe yeah. kids or believe teens, no, no, no. This is incorrect. And they are being led. I mean, in California, we start at a very, at five, you know, kindergarten with a gender ideology curriculum, a gender curriculum, which tells them that only they know their true gender and that gender has nothing to do with biological sex and that you effectively are the only one who can know it. So what's yours? And then they, you know, give them this buffet from which to choose. And already it's in the kid's head that only I know a gender is something that is private to me. Only I know and, you know, lo and behold, many of them choose something more exotic than, you know, cisgender. They choose the ones that that get, get them a lot more adulation and, and peer yeah. approval. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing this, you know, in the numbers, we're seeing numbers of trans identified kids that don't make, you know, and trans identified teens that don't make any sense. Yeah, it's this black and white uh, Manichaean thinking uh, where it's either there's only men and women and nothing else. Or anybody could be anything they want. It's just this spectrum. No. Uh, it, it helps if you kind of break through that and think, well, there's fuzzy sets. This comes from my friend Bart Costco, who was, who was doing fuzzy logic in the 90s. Uh, you know, what what, what, co what color is, what's a blue sunset? Well, you know, it's shades, right? But but there's blue and then there's orange. And, and they're not like just practically the same. No, you can just sort of have overlapping fuzzy sets uh, like race. Right. So we have this idea, well, there's blacks and there's whites. No, what's Tiger Woods? Right. I don't know if you saw the, the Tiger Woods documentary on HBO. It's quite good. I think it's four hours long. They have a whole thing about his race. Right. And, you know, his fa his mother is Asian and his father is black, but his father's mother was white. You know, so uh, Tiger, once he became famous, had this thing he called Kabul Asian. I'm Kabul. I'm not black. I'm Kabul Asian. And of course, you know, people like Oprah are like, no, dude, please, we need you in the black. We need you to be black because, you know, anyway. Uh, and, and this is just hopelessly confused, but not if you just think, well, they're fuzzy sets. They're, you know, there's people that are mostly white people that are mostly black, but there's a lot of overlapping. Think of it as a Venn diagram, maybe. And uh, here, I think, you know, whatever the correct percentage is, 99% or 98%, whatever it is. It's mostly men, mostly cis men, cis women, but there is over, there's some fuzzy la uh, overlapping there that we need to study, and there's still a lot we don't know. Taking aside that, you know, that they uh, universal human rights, everybody should get the same treatment and so on. Well, I was going to bring up a point. You mentioned uh, uh, the pronoun issue. So here I could see where, um, you know, a difference between private and government enforcement. So if if I come to you and say, I'd like you to call me Michelle instead of Michael, and, and my pronouns are she instead of he, and, and maybe because you're my friend now, you'd go, yeah, okay, Michael, Michelle, I'll do that. Uh, but that would be different than me going to your employer saying, you know, if if she doesn't call me this, I'm going to sick the government on you. And that's the distinction between private and public here, right? That's right. And, and in fact, you know, look, this is a distinction the Constitution even makes. I mean, the Constitution prohibits, you know, the government from, um, you know, um, criminalizing speech, not not individuals from policing it, but but private individuals. But but also, I mean, just personally, I, you know, I know a lot of transgender people at this point and I use their preferred pronouns because it strikes me as the courteous thing to do. And I have no ideological commitment otherwise. Um um, where, where, where things, things get confusing is when we say statements like trans women are women in the public sphere. And that that sometimes gets very confusing because of course, you know, there are biological differences between trans women who are biological men and biological women. And, um, being able to point out those differences becomes really difficult when you've now confused all the terms. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, I do think in the public sphere, we, we need to, we need to be clear um, yeah, at risk of hurting people's feelings so that we can have these conversations to begin with and know what we're talking about. Well, that's what, as you know, put Jordan Peterson on the map is when he objected to Bill C-16 in Canadian law that lumped not using the preferred pronouns as a form of hate speech, uh, the equivalent of, say, Holocaust denial or something like that. Uh, again, the difference between you ask, because Jordan said, you know, if you ask me to call you that, I will, unless you're trying to bait me into some Borat type trap. But 
otherwise, yeah, of course I would. But that's different than the government compelling speech in the Constitution. Compel, compelled speech can't do that. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, but And also, when would I use your preferred pronouns to you? I wouldn't refer... I wouldn't say Abigail she. I'd say Abigail you, because you're standing here in front of me. So it would only be in the third person if I said to your husband, your wife told me she did this versus your wife told me he did that, if that was your preferred pronoun, but you wouldn't be there. Or else I'd say you, right? right? So when, when would this... Well, it, <laughs> when does it occur? Yeah. I, there are transgender adults that I, you know, there's certainly transgender adults that I'm, you know, that I know or I'm friendly with and I always refer to in public as as their preferred pronoun um, because for them specifically, it's it's something that feels like the right thing to do um, as individuals. But when I'm talking about eight, you know, trans women more generally as a mm. category, if we're talking about, for instance, should they be in biological women's prisons, then I think we have to t be very clear mm. on what the issue is and what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is putting biological men writ large into uh, prison with biological women. That's what we're talking about. And I think that's what we need to get clear on. But but yeah, individually, I do that all the time. You know, I, I refer to, you know, my friends who are transgender by whatever, you know, they were uh, even in the third person, by whatever they would, you know, prefer. <laughs> I've told this story before in the podcast when I was at Pepperdine University as an undergraduate, I had a my roommate who I'd gone to high school with too. Uh, his name was Dwayne and he did not like his name. So one day he announced, my new name is D'Artagnan. It's like, D'Artagnan? You mean like of the Three Musketeers, D'Artagnan? Yeah, that one. Like, how how do you spell that? And then he finally shortened it to Dar, D apostrophe A R T. And, and I still talk to him, and, and and I don't even think of him as Dwayne anymore. He's Dar, and he changed it on his driver's license. And would you please oh, call wow. me D'Artagnan? It's like, yeah, okay, D'Artagnan, and then Dar, okay, sure, whatever, you know, no big deal. But again, that's different than you know you compelling somebody to call you that, I suppose. Um, anyway, that's just kind of a well, yeah, it's certainly different than the government doing it. You know, in American law, I mean, we're we're you know, uh, we, we have this very robust, you know, First Amendment protection in, in America from the government. And of course, we're seeing the problem right now is that the government is now, you know, sort of working with, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the most, you know, um, I, I think um, uh, the, the, the greatest threats to free speech are now coming from technology firms, which are arguably, arguably more more powerful than the government. So, you know, that that that's a question of what what to do and and whether, you know, whether we can justify, you know, pushing back on those restrictions on speech. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's kind of wrap up by just kind of giving us the bigger picture of where sure. you think go things are going for the future. I have a 29-year-old daughter from a previous marriage and and she missed all this, uh, thank goodness. Uh, I'm not sure she would have gone down that path anyway, but whatever. But now I have a four and a half, almost five year old, and and so, and my wife uh, Jennifer moved here from Cologne, Germany, and uh, she's been worried about this since we moved here. She moved here, and I keep telling her the pendulum's going to swing back any month, any year. Now it's all going to go back. It's all the crazy far left, woke, progressive, you know, all that stuff. And and every pretty much every week she go, there's some new story, and she's like, "When's that pendulum swinging back, Michael?" <laughs> and now she's out looking. We're going to go looking at these private schools here where we live because it's like she's worried about the public schools getting uh, inculcated, all this stuff. And that and our little guy, you know, he doesn't know what sex, gender, rate. He doesn't even think about any of this stuff. And we're worried about, you know, the teachers and, uh, you know, parent, whatever, talking about this. This is insane. How worried should we be? When's that pendulum swinging back? I don't see any time soon on this issue. And the reason is, is because not only is it baked in now to it's baked into so many of our laws and our institutions. So, you know, it's in the schools are now teaching this gender ideology at a very, very young age um, in California. It starts at age five. And if you dare object as a parent, you're labeled a transphobe. Um, the, we now have, a, a, um, so-called conversion therapy bans in 20 states, which means a therapist, 
um, who tries to help an adolescent who says they're gender dysphoric, tries to help them co- get comfortable in their body and suggest, or even just suggest that maybe gender dysphoria is not the problem. Maybe their gender isn't the problem. Maybe it's something else. Um, they can, they are at risk of running afoul of these so-called conversion therapy laws that they're actually trying to convert someone out of being trans is the, would be the allegation. Um, and, and you're having this young group, crew of activist doctors. I hear from young medical students all the time who tell me how indoctrinated they're getting in medical school where they're being told, you know, if a, someone is a trans, you know, male or female, you're to pr- effectively pretend that they have different anatomy. Um, and um, and there, there's th- this is now being baked into so many aspects of society that I think it will be a while before this trend reverses. Oh, dear. I never would have thought of myself as a homeschooler, but well, you're a parent. How old are your kids? Where do they go? To, are you worried about this for your kids? Um, I think if anything, my my kids have probably heard too much about oh, this. Okay, unfortunately, well, that's um, true. But but because of you know <laughs> having watched me you know write this book and then defend it, but um, you know, look, m- no, my kids are not in public school. Um, but some of the private schools are no better. Mm. Um, the the indoctrination of of kids now in this woke ideology that's so intolerant, so illiberal, and, and frankly cares nothing about science and facts um, is 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 really worrisome. And it's something that America that parents really should start standing up to. Yeah. All right. Well, you're doing your share. I'll do my share. What we can. And uh, so, what's next? Uh, well, let's see. Your paperback's coming out in a couple months, and then what? What are you going to do after that? What's your next book project? I think I'm going to return to this generation and and more generally sort of zoom out and look at this generation of teen girls. Okay, on lots of different issues. You mean? Yeah. Yeah, yes, that's, that's good. Right. That's good. Okay.